Hello everyone, welcome. I hope you enjoyed that nice um, musical interview that's me prepared to get started and wait for more people to join. My name is Michaela. I'm the event coordinator for Sankofa Video and Books. Um, we are a small Black-owned bookstore that is dedicated to supplying the community with books that are by and about people of African descent. So thank you so much for joining this discussion tonight between Dr. Joshua Myers and Mr. James Early for the discussion on Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition, which is the first major um, book to tackle the life and times of the political activist and historian Cedric Robinson. And this book can be purchased at www.sankofa.com. Please feel free throughout the discussion to post any comments or questions you have because Dr. Myers or Dr. James, or Mr. James Early, they will um, interact with you that way. So please don't hesitate whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. You can comment and you'll be heard. So um, before they dive into their conversation, let me tell you a little bit about our guest speakers tonight, starting with the author, Joshua Myers. He's the Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Howard University. He's the author of We Are Worth Fighting For, A History of the University Student Protest of 1989, which we see is actually um, repeating itself. He's also the editor of A Gathering Together, a literary journal. Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition is his second book. And he is in conversation tonight with Mr. James Early, who served as assistant provost for educational and cultural programs 
Assistant Secretary for Education and Public Service and Interim Director of the Smithsonian Anacostia Museum, which I love. So everyone, please give a virtual round of applause to our conversants tonight. Thank you, Michaela Skirlock. It is uh, indeed an honor to participate uh, with uh, Sankofa Video Books and Cafe, uh, described as a small bookstore that has, I would venture to say, a huge uh, impact uh, in, on its neighbor, uh, Howard University, as the founders of Sankofa, Haile Garima, and uh, his wife, Shurikiana, both filmmakers and instructors, uh, have set up uh, this as really a bit more than a bookstore. It is a center of debate and critical reflection uh, to not only inform understanding, but to inform uh, literally how people can uh, carry on wholesome personal lives and quite significantly engage in uh, transformative uh, radical change, uh, specifically around people of African descent, not only in Washington, D.C. and across the U.S., but around the world. And as it is with that backdrop in mind uh, of the role that this video cafe, uh, cultural political organizing center in conjunction with Howard University, uh, where uh, Dr. Josh Myers is a professor of African-American studies, a very important uh, historical center. Um, I think of uh, Howard University grand figures that tie into our subject matter tonight uh, like uh, the late Dr. Stephen Henderson, uh, the late Sterling Brown, uh, Elaine Locke, uh, all of whose names might come up again. Uh, but I'm also very happy to read um, this extraordinary piece of work uh, by uh, Josh Myers. And, uh, you know, we know Cedric Robinson, uh, most of us by this book, uh, Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition. Uh, what Josh Myers has brought to us is um, Cedric Robinson, the time of the Black radical tradition. And in order to get a, a sense of um, the fundamentals of this book, because there's so much to cover that we will not be able to cover in a few hours, let me start by asking uh, Dr. Myers, tell us who Cedric Robinson was uh, in this uh biography, which is really a socio-cultural historical biography, it seems to me, not just an individual profile biography. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that question. And um, I have to start by thanking Sankofa too. It is um, a place so formative uh, to me as a uh, thinker and a person of African descent. Um, when I was a student um, at Howard University, uh, listening to Haile Garima, Shuri, um, Ackland Lynch, not often talking to them, but just listening. And um, it's one of the reasons that I send my students there now all the time uh, because of that, the importance of that space. And so when I think about the fact that, you know, we launched my first book there. Um, and as we launched my first book, uh, We Are Worth Fighting For, uh, Michaela is right. The history is currently repeating itself. Um, so if you're not aware, um, the students at Howard right now are engaged um, in the Blackburn takeover, um, another act of what I would like to call student radicalism too. Um, and also, of course, uh, this book was partially, like the last book, written inside Sankofa. And so it's very appropriate in many ways uh, to uh, be launching the book uh, with this very important institution. Please support um, this institution. Uh, it, it, must, it must continue, it must continue, it must be available for, for um, the subsequent generations. Um, and so thank you, uh, Michaela Skurlock, thank you, Shukiana, thank you, Haile. Also thank you, Ada Saloon, who was actually um, the organizer for the Critical Reading Series, along with Haile, uh, where uh, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism was one of the books uh, that we engage in that series. And so this is in many ways, a continuation of a conversation that we've already started at Sankofa. And I'm very happy to have James Early uh, be an interlocutor um, for this particular iteration of it. Um, someone who I deeply admire and respect, um, his ability to synthesize and connect uh, the various strands of our intellectual and cultural history 
is in many ways a model for us. And so I hope you pay attention to what he's going to do as much as you pay attention uh, to how um, I'm going to engage with this conversation as well. And so for me, Cedric Robinson uh, is, is an African who's descended from Africans from Mobile, Alabama directly, um, but he grew up in a community in West Oakland. Uh, he was the first uh, in that particular family uh, to grow up, to be born in Oakland um, in 1940. And so his family, he lived in the house of people who were migrants from the South. Um, they instilled in him a love of learning, a love of study, but it actually occurred within the backdrop of their religion. Um, they were Seventh-day Adventists. And so there was a very strong consideration of biblical study and biblical ethics, Christian ethics, I should say, um, that grounded their, their notion of love, their notion of care. Um, but his Aunt Wilma um, exposed him to Black history in a broader sense, Black culture in a broader sense. Uh, she was a teacher's aide. And part of her uh, job was dealing with the curriculum. And so she sort of gave him the sense of his identity as a consequence of her ability to engage the, the curriculum in, uh, in the Oakland school system. Um, the gaps in the curriculum, the things that weren't covered in the curriculum. And that would become a theme um, in Cedric's work as well. And so from that foundation, he ends up going through the public schools in Berkeley, ends up at the University of California, Berkeley, one of very few uh, students of African descent. Um, there were tens of thousands of students there, but there were less than 200 or so uh, black students, including the students from the continent of Africa uh, who were there uh, from Kenya, uh, part of the uh, uh, Kennedy Airlift students when President Kennedy supported the education of Kenyan students. And we know why. Uh, we, don't have to, we can get into why later, but that was a very important uh, connection to Africa early on. Um, and so he becomes a student organizer uh, because with that many students, of course, there were many issues and um, the racism of that university, not only of the university, but of the Bay Area in general, offered many opportunities for young student organizers. And this is the late 1950s. And so it's before what many people might call the golden era of black student activism. It's a decade before. Um, and so when he was there, he was the vice president of the campus NAACP. And they were a radical NAACP. They were on the Robert F. Williams side of things in the NAACP. And they actually invited Robert F. Williams to, uh, to speak on campus mere months after he had come back from Cuba the first time. Um, and so that's a very important connection, of course, to some of the things that you have dedicated your life to understanding. Uh, our brother James. And when the Cuban Missile Crisis happens, this months after Williams comes on campus, Cedric helps lead a protest, um, not the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, Cedric leads, helps lead a uh, protest, which gets him in trouble, and he ends up going to Mexico uh, that summer uh, while he was suspended from uh, Berkeley. He also ends up bringing Malcolm X in between his case, and, and which, is, which causes another controversy around free speech. Long story, to make a very long story short, that starts the development of, of a group called the Afro-American Association. Um, Howard, University law, uh, Howard University graduates who are in law school at Berkeley uh, helped develop this organization. And when, it's the precursor to the Revolutionary Action uh, Movement, the West Coast chapter, as well as the precursor to what becomes both iterations of the Black Panther Party. And so Cedric is involved in all of that. And um, even when he's not in the middle of it, right, um, he's involved in, with the communities that are involved in that. He also goes to Africa. And this is all before he graduates um, in 1963. He spends time in Southern Rhodesia. Um, he meets Matt and Evelyn Crawford, old school communists of the, in the Bay Area. He meets their friends, William and Louise Patterson, when he goes to New York. Um, and so by the time he gets his PhD, he already has a PhD in the black radical tradition because of these connections, because of his organizing. And so and now with his work, it became an opportunity to sort of synthesize and theorize all of those experiences, but also to center the people, to center the consciousness of the people. And his, it's, it's never divorced from his life as an activist and an organizer, but he does enter into the Black Studies movement. And that's where he spends the balance of his life's work. 
helping build Black studies? You know, I wanted to start with that question because I'm hopeful that there are a number, not only of students and young professors in the audience, but uh, political organizers in the audience um, who are searching, who are moving about, who are unsure, uh, but accept that they should be moving forward in the interest of justice for Black people, centered around Black people. And so that I, I was really um, uh, brought deeply into your uh, writings in those first chapters where you set a broad socio-cultural context of a family, of friends, of community, of jobs that uh, I suspect in many other biographies might not have uh, taken on the resonance that you have set that context in. So mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to start there so that uh, some of the younger scholars and students and activists might think about their own lives as they read this book and you must read this book. There are so many um, weighty constructs with regard to engaging Western civilization from the point of view of Black lives. And it's really uh, interesting to me that uh, when you look at the cover of this book, uh, Black lives is all over. And so I hope that's a point that we can get back to because yeah. uh, it, it picks up a historical theme and gives it a contemporary um, edge, both national and, and, and global. But yeah. What were some of the challenges um, uh, in, in, in taking on this work, doing this, this yeah. biography? And is it accurate to call it more of a social biography than as an individual profile? It has, it has, it was, a, it was necessary for it to be a social biography because Cedric never centered himself. And so it was, he would, he would never have written a memoir or an autobiography himself which if you look at some of the major biographies of 19th uh, and 20th century figures, a lot of it is based on the fact that these people left traces in their memoirs, in their autobiographies, which of course, you know, become not sole sort of source material. But it, it, it's very, very rare that the major biographies deviate from that. And so he never centered himself, he centered the work. And so, I realized that in order to actually write about him, I, I would have had to center the work. And that's kind of how this, this project began. And so um, the Black Lives piece is part of a series called Black Lives. That's why the cover has Black Lives. Um, and I knew that this would be someone that people would, would learn more about in terms of his personal life, but I still didn't feel comfortable just making it a personal, a purely personal, uh, story with all the scandals of personhood and the, the very complicated nature and complex uh, lives that we all lead, right? One could tell that story, but I wanted to tell the story of the context for the development of his ideas. And that's where um, I ended up. And so my approach um, was to try, to try to figure out what made his approach to Black studies so resonant for me. Because I encountered Cedric Robinson as a Black studies scholar as someone who is trying to develop a lens uh, to understand the, uh, the authority and the autonomy of Black cultural and Black intellectual life and traditions. Because Black studies has to have a lens that centers the autonomy of Black thinking and Black cultural traditions in order to narrate how we tell, who we tell the stories of who we are, but also how we create methodologies for studying us. And so for that reason, Robinson's work uh, spoke to me, but I had to figure out why it spoke to me, what happened in his life to make it speak to me. So there are a number of challenges. Um, the first is the master narrative couldn't help me. And so we had to discard the master narratives about black power, we had to discard the master narratives about the emergence of black studies to a degree. Um, I had to discard the narratives about Black life in the Bay Area to a certain degree um, in order to get at what was concealed, what was hidden. Um, and so thankfully I had the blessings of Cedric's family and Cedric's family and Cedric's friends, they opened me up to what they actually saw that challenged, but also affirmed certain parts of the narratives that we've been given about those ideas. And so what I was able to do uh, with their reflections and with their memories was to weave a tapestry of 
Cedric's personality and character that connected to what I knew and resonated with within his intellectual work. Um, it was in talking to them. It was in engaging with them. Sometimes it was with crying with them because some people I had talked to had not talked to, had not talked about him or talked to him um, in several decades. And it was at least one person said, I'm so glad because nobody ever thought to talk to me about this period. Um, and that was during his, his college years. Um, I actually met via email someone who was in middle school um, with Cedric. And so there were a lot of those, those kinds of moments. And I, and I think that opened, opened me up um, to not doing you know, strictly an intellectual biography because it has to speak to the character too. And so we are intellectuals, but we also are people. And I think that has to come into the conversation as much as we want to talk about the socio-political context. I had to go back to the personal, but it was the personal in connection with the work. And so that gave me a lens to actually go into the archives with. And so I did go into the archives. I went to the places where he worked. I went to um, the places uh, where he went to school, of course. Um, when I went to Berkeley, I had to look for all the disciplinary files <laughs> to find him. <laughs> um, when I went to places like Binghamton, for instance, I had to look for the places where he's concealed from the narratives, including the founding of the, Bro the, the Braddell, Fernand Braddell Center um, you know, with Emmanuel Wallerstein and the World mm -hmm. uh, uh, Analysts. Um, and so he's in those places too, but there's no, there's no folder named Cedric Robinson. And so... <laughs> It was that kind of search. It was that kind kind of journey. If I if I only had the archives, it would have been much more bare. Um, but the archives that were there were given life by the by the conversations and the testimonies and uh, the memories, as well as the support um, of not only Cedric's friends and family, but also Cedric's students. So now that I have all of that, I can I can develop a portrait. Um, and to be to be uh, to be fair, it's my portrait. And I hope that that many more portraits are added to my portrait. I don't I don't want this to be a definitive biography by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but once I got there, I could then feel my way through why his narration of the Black radical tradition always resonated for me. I could tell that particular story of why it resonated because I got a sense of the person and how the person was inspired by produced by, made by the tradition that he's actually writing about. And then it starts to make sense why he never centered himself. So there are many weighty concepts that he came up with, some of which, a few of which um, I'd like for us to talk about a little later. Uh, but it strikes me that the, the question of methodology, the question of point of view about the world mm -hmm. and how one then figures who is one in the world in relationship uh, to the normative uh, dimensions of the world, to the, such normative terms as uh, democracy, uh, as citizens. Um, I, I noticed in a number of his first person references that you did find, uh, the term black folk, folk comes up. It's not mm -hmm. black people, it's black folk. Would you talk a little about that point of view and and what were the methodological implications to get him to some of the some of the major theories that he turns into uh, practice and organizing practice. Well, he, he was he was a part of the folk, and I think that by being a part of the thing that you write about, right, um, that gives you a a different kind of lens, and that lens is not one that's only or simply. Um, about accuracy as much as it's about making sure that you can have an ethical relationship to the to the to the topic and to people that are covered in that topic and in that text. And that's forced to practice too. Just because you're born in it doesn't mean it doesn't make an automatic, right? You have to practice that. You have to you have to, you know, be a part of that in a way that people recognize you as a part of that, right? And so it's not simply automatic, but it's there in his work. Um, and I and I didn't understand that until I engaged with the family and the, and the people who knew the family. Um, you know, I, 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 although different in self uh, description between he and Du Bois, mm 
uh, as I was reading through this, I thought about Souls of Black Folk in 1903, and where Du Bois says, least you be confused, I am bone and bone and flesh of flesh yes. of the people behind the veil. There's a lot in that metaphor, but mm -hmm. looking at the interior lives uh, of how Black ordinary people yes. uh, in their profound and expressive ways saw and acted on the world, not just responding to how the world acted on them, yes. seemed to be a, a, a context. It, would, it, is that a, an accurate frame or a useful yes. framework? I think it's both accurate, accurate and useful. And it shows up in, in a number of his texts. And, and one uh, text that I wish uh, was more widely read is his, his book, Black Movements in America. Um, where he talks about the ordinary moments of resistance. At the same time, he talks about the people that we all know and he puts them in conversation, um, including the passage where he actually cites his own grandfather, but he doesn't say, this is my grandfather, <laughs> right? But he says, people like Winston Whiteside migrated because X, Y, and Z, right? In looking at migration as part of the um, re refusal, right? Um, and so for me, um, I read that book as an undergraduate uh, with Greg Carr in Introduction to African-American Studies at Howard University. That's the first time I encountered Cedric Robinson. And so that was always there for me. Um, so, so the met methodological contribution as I see it has to do with um, asserting a kind of black cultural authority and how it relates to our conceptions of resistance, right? So it's not just a culture that's autonomous, a folk culture that's there and it's, that's all we do with it. It's also the basis for resistance. Um, power concedes nothing without a demand, but power does not determine how those are forcing it to concede, right? The force that confronts power is not a product of power. It is a product of who the people are that are doing the resisting. And so how we conceive of what they are resisting matters. Um, Cedric gave me language to think about how that was connected to what is central to Black studies, the self-determining terms for studying ourselves. Um, it inspired in me the idea that we did not need other folks' disciplinary language in order to have a conversation with ourselves. Uh, we see it also how he confronted the work of political theory because he ultimately rejects political theory as he's getting a PhD in political theory because it doesn't, it didn't help him understand that conversation about power, right? And so that brings him to the black radical tradition and he doesn't invent it. He doesn't um, even create the original theories behind it, right? Because it was always there. Um, and so that's, where the methodological intervention is for me, it's, it's in centering the people's consciousness as a, as, we, as we, he often wrote, as the negation of the Western civilization, but not simply the negation, right? It's more than that too. Um, and that's where we get, I think the foundation and connection to contemporary forms of resistance, right? Because insofar as we are undermining the very terms under which this capitalist imperialist order has constructed, Insofar as we consciously undermine that, we're participating in Black radicalism. You know, I think of um, Leroy Jones, a Mary Baraka point of view. You listen to John Coltrane and you listen to Stan Getz. You yes. may enjoy the music of both, but in order to fully understand that music, it's not just a technical issue, it's point of view. What were the, what was the socio-political cultural context uh, out of which they were expressing their humanity, not just fighting against their opposition, but expressing mm -hmm. their humanity. I think of Sterling Brown and the, the WPA, the Writers Project, and where he went down south, sent down by Carter G. Woodson uh, and his father, the minister at Howard University, uh, to not just study Black folk, but to learn from Black folk. And so that when you uh, look at the critical writings, Sterling Brown very well may have been the first to open up the formal study of the folk, uh, of a sociological, not just expressive culture. Uh, but in that context, you mentioned then he brings this to bear on the fundamental aspects of Western civilization, right? Uh, both at the philosophical level and then in particular uh, around uh, what emerged as Marxism and ultimately Marxist-Leninism and taking on the capitalist system. Right. Would you br bring us into this um, term about the order of power? Uh, uh, I, yes. I'm, mis I'm misnaming it, but give yeah. us that framework and, and tell me whether that's a kind of central point of, um, of uh, departure. 
so yeah, um, I always I always believed um, that his first book, The Terms of Order, um, Political Science and the Myth of Leadership, is a really important text to read alongside Black Marxism. Because what that text is actually doing is destabilizing the notion that those who are in power, right, have the, have have total authority over human beings and their possibilities. And so if you can accept that, then you can accept that the idea of black radicalism, the idea of the black radical tradition is literally the evidence of how black people confront power. And that's why it was so consistent because it was a confrontation with the holistic and the full throat of not only Western civilization, but the political and economic order that comes out of Western civilization. So that's really what Robinson is doing in his analysis of the, of the question of order, his analysis of the, of the question of power. And to the extent that in order that he reaches that by a critique of the idea of the political, we have to unpack how the political was able to assert itself as if it did have power. And what happens is that the political as a conceptual apparatus of the political and economic order, the notion that we are represented by a leader, right? A political leader, that we are organized in systems that are that are given by their relationship to political leadership is an appropriation of the thing that you believe in order to free yourself. And so instead of using that thing, like he uses the term charisma as, a, as an example, Instead of using the thing that you would use to free yourself, the leader, the idea of political leadership appropriates, appropriates it and then represents that thing as the political leadership, right? And so we feel charisma when we see a, president, a presidential speech and we don't feel charisma when somebody's in the streets carrying out the system, right? Because of the idea that the political has appropriated the very terms of how liberation struggles have actually went forth. And that's a complex argument, and there's a lot of room for disagreement and, and debate. But the point is, when radical systems do the same appropriation, it limits the capacities or the it limits the expectations that people have the capacity for being free in the ways that they understand liberation, in the way that their human consciousness allows them to practice liberation and freedom. You know, in, in this regard, I, I think that Cedric Robertson uh, intersects uh, a part of what Elaine Locke was laying out in The New Negro uh, when he uh, really said that political leaders were following the political masses. He turned it on its head. Um, or when Sterling Brown looking at the cultural question, and this it seems to me that Cedric Robinson is, is situated uh, in looking beyond politics as a kind of concentrated expression of economic relations, which is a key to Marxist analysis about class formation, the working class being the motive force of history. It's not mm -hmm. that he denies the significance of the working class in that relational construct between capitalists and workers. But what he says is it does not go deep enough to see what is the attitude, what is the outlook of the historical right. frameworks that uh, this situation was pressed on people. They were not tabla rasas, they were not blank spaces. They had cosmological outlooks, they had religious views, they had social organizations, relationships between men, women, and children and nature. And they took that despite the uh, oppressive and brutal and inhumane nature that was imposed on them by this new economic system and mm -hmm. use that with agency to mm -hmm. to give expression to their humanity and not be defined simply or even qualitatively by mm -hmm. the oppressive system that they were in and and so this this brings me to the question of some of the really staring but i would say wholesome critiques that robinson brings because he was not trying to look at these individuals as individuals of marx or hegel or even Du Bois or CLR James. Um, mm -hmm. But he did, I would say, wholesomely embrace and critique them to take their arguments to a deeper foundational level. And in this regard, it strikes me that 
it puts him in line and on the order of Antonio Gramsci and the role of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, uh, as, a, he, as he noted, a foundational person for him in terms of theorizing political organization and activity was Amal, uh, Amal Khal Cabral. Would you yes. talk to us a, a, about that and tell me if I've distorted that in, in any way that you might want to bring back into focus? I don't hear any distortion. <laughs> um, Cabral, Cabral is a central figure for him. And I, I probably say that two or three times um, in the text because, you know, there's a one thing I didn't want to challenge every critique, but there's a persistent critique that he's not thinking about Africa, but Africa is everywhere. Um, the continent of Africa um, is everywhere um, in his work. And um, when you follow his reading of Cabral, you see it. Um, you know, I found in the, one of the earliest outlines of the text, Black Marxism, um, that the intention was to do two volumes. And so even the three people that constitute part three were not supposed to be the only three people that we talk about, um, Du Bois, uh, James, and Wright. Um, I, I do believe in the second volume there would have been a chapter on Cabral, um, which I, I'm sure would have clarified a lot. Um, but in terms of um, the relationship to the individuals that you mentioned, I, I have to add also um, Ella Jo Baker, uh, Septima Poinsett Clark, um, who he writes about in Black Movements in America as also embodying um, a form of revolutionary organizing. Um, Charlie Cobb calls it the organizing tradition. Um, that is a continuation into the 20th century of what we were doing in terms of our resistance um, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th traditions. Um, and it's Ella Jo Baker who puts it in words, right, about this notion of leadership because she saw in many ways um, the function of a kind of uh, charisma when it was in a place of the single leader or the group of leaders and not within this the community. Um, charisma, charisma's proper place was in, was, is with the people. It's not supposed to be the single possession of um, a, a single leader. And uh, Robinson writes beautifully about that concept in his first scholarly paper, uh, which is on Malcolm X, um, who he's nothing without the followers, right? The followers create him. And then in turn, we get who he becomes. And it's represented to the followers, which is simply a reflection of who you already were. And it's a beautiful formulation um, that he uses with, with Malcolm. And so I think um, the socialist, what he calls the socialist impulse um, in his book, The Anthropology of Marxism, uh, where he goes back into the history of Europe and, and looks at the peasant rebellions and he looks at the heretical traditions against the church, he says the socialist impulse is always there in human beings, right? And wherever we go in the globe, there's always going to be a socialist impulse because at its, at its root is this notion of being together, being one. It's a concept that he often talked about, right? And so the question becomes what happens when uh, that socialist impulse is connected to a kind of theoretical precision or theoretical uh, system? Does, it, does that theoretical system properly honor, does it properly um, characterize uh, that socialist impulse? And his uh, uh, conclusion is that the record is mixed. And so this brings him into, again, I would say wholesome critique, not at a personality level of the talented tenth of Du Bois, Yes. Or brings him into a wholesome, deeper, productive critique of Karl Marx uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the notion of the vanguard, or yes. Leninism and the notion of vanguard, and brings him very much more in alignment um, with C.L.R. James, uh, overly determined and referenced, I think, in terms of his Trotskyism. But C.L.R. Mm -hmm. James is getting at the integrity and the profundity of ordinary life and the will, that impulse to live and to live with a deep, there's a humanism that you certainly at the end of the book and, and talking about Robinson brings us back to him more as a kind of individual figure, which I hope we could end on at some point, mm 
of, of his humanism, but not get into now. But but would you talk about that that uh, engagement um, of the perspectives of of Du Bois and Marx and and Cyril yeah. R. James? Uh, were he uh, had unity, but also where he departed again, not against them as individuals, but sure. in trying to find where is the empowerment, uh, this notion of the power of the people. Right, right, right. Well, as far as um, uh, Marx and Engels are concerned, he actually um, appreciates far more about them than I think the uh, the public has given credence to. Um, I reject the idea um, that the text is um, anti-Marxist. I think it's a critique of Marx, yes. um, but it's also not a Marxist book, right? And so there should be space for it to exist in that in that in that realm, right? It's not neither Marxist or anti-Marxist, right? Um, but he does share um, uh, with Marx the radical potential of people power, people having power, or people taking power, or people constituting their lives um, against the system, right? I think the departure has to do with where he locates um, that potential and in that, that power. Um, and so you see uh, the, the critique really of the notion of labor as existing within a particular order, right? Or labor being ordered in a particular way. Um, he says, when you look at the uh, revolutions of the enslaved, they were workers, but they also participated in a revolution on terms that were theirs, right? And so it doesn't follow, right, this sort of step, not even a step-by-step, step, but this sort of systemic uh, evolution um, that I think Cedric's real beef is with the kind of social science that comes out of this, right? Um, that says that we can have a positive knowledge about how revolutions actually happen. Um, the philosophical Marx, he finds a lot to agree with, right? Um, the Marx who talks about um, the notion of, um, of haunting, a, a specter's uh, haunting, he finds a lot to agree with, right? Um, and the same is true, I think, in his engagement uh, with Engels. And I think part of his engagement with, with Engels was um, Engels' own critique uh, that he and Marx had put too much emphasis on the right. economic side of things. Right, and that's a direct quote yeah. from, from, from Engels. Right, yeah. right. So I think that has to be said. Um, the other part is, of course, Marxist, Marxism has a life after Marx and Engels. And when you look at organized Marxism, to use the term uh, Minko Makalani uses, um, there's a long critique of uh, black radicals engaging with the organized left um, that has to be um, that has to be made partisan. In fact, I think that, that critique is what opens up um, Cedric's work in many ways, right? It is the George Padmore's of the world, C.L.R. James's of the world um, that opened him up to this. And he's he was, in the case of James, he knew James, right? There's a relationship. There was a long correspondence. He brought James to University of Michigan as a as a as a uh, lecturer on su on Saturday mornings, which grew into a visiting lectureship. Um, he came to D.C. with his students to visit uh, C.L.R. James. So there's a very real uh, comradely relationship um, that's taking place between he and James. Um, that I think um, what I found most, um, I think, generative was the two of them going back on uh, how Lenin talked about the peasantry, right? And you see James influenced by that uh, conversation with Robinson. Um, and I, write, I write about that um, when you look at uh, James's lectures at the Institute of the Black World, um, where he talked about how he would rewrite the Black Jacobins if he could rewrite it in 1968. I think that's a lot of that's coming out of conversations with people like Cedric Robinson. Um, of course, with the Institute of, also with the Institute of the Black World and, and, the, and the left that he's engaged in the United States and abroad. This is with Vincent oh. Hardy. I, I very well, my memory is so bad at almost 75, but I yeah. was at the Institute of the Black World. I was not one of the principals. I was one of the younger people that Vincent Hardy, mm -hmm. among others, brought in. Uh, but I'm all but certain I was sitting in that audience uh, when he came and also in his exchanges with the Black Bolshevik, Harry, Harry Haywood, who had brought the Negro national question back from the 1928 common turn. Mm -hmm. um, and Cedric meets Haywood and brings him to Binghamton and he also brings him to Santa Barbara. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, connections and synergies here around that 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 generation that engages organized Marxism, uh, whether it's through uh, the Communist Party of the USA or through other formations um, that were uh, that were there. Um, with Du Bois, um, 
he's thinking about Du Bois' writing of history. He's thinking about uh, how Du Bois talked about Liberia and related to the Garveyism. Um, he's talking about uh, uh, Du Bois' uh, development as a person. Um, and so he does, Du Bois does write that he's bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh. Um, but, you know, Du Bois confronts it differently. He feels it differently in Great Barrington, Massachusetts than he does when he's in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and so that's really important. Um, but ultimately, uh, Du Bois's rejection of the Talented Tim is also a rejection of vanguardism, I think. And when you see him um, talk about revolution, when you see Du Bois talk about revolution, um, he takes it back to Reconstruction period. Um, and it's in the midst of that same moment that I just got finished explaining, which is Black people's engagement with the organized left. Um, and so absolutely, uh, in the cultural authority of the enslaved Africans who resisted during the Civil War, who, who resisted, resisted uh, during Reconstruction, we find more elements of Black radicalism to think about and to think with. How might they have created the world that they wanted to create in that particular moment? It's a really important question to ask. Well, you know, one of the things in my read, reading of your work and, and in the socio-cultural, uh, theoretical, political profile, underscoring the social context, I, when I think about Du Bois, um, whom I never met, but C.L.R. James, whom I did meet and did a number of interviews with Ethelbert Miller with him and spent some close time, uh, and I spent a lot of time with Harry Haywood, uh, I would say that Du Bois, Haywood, and James, um, as individual figure, figures, sort of felt their weight vis-a-vis uh, -vis the masses and their need. But it, it seemed like your portrait of Cedric Robinson is he really was part and parcel of the mass, even as he had these uh, distinguished ideas. And he was not unaware of the weight of his ideas but it was right. never his individual posture that was leaning. It was the understanding uh, of, of how the people could make more manifest their own interior development um, to change things. Is, is that a, 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 a comprehensible framework? Or you... there's, a, there's a very real belief in the people. And that is, when you, when you are, a revolutionary or, or a radical and you have these expectations that we're going to fight for our liberation and fight for our freedom and all of those things that go in sometimes the people can disappoint you right um but if they did disappoint Cedric you never see that I mean he always right. found right. something about the people to latch on to when he says yes this is happening but also this is happening and you have to go and think about what what this is and so one of the things that he, we, one of the reasons that we have to study um, this community media is because it emerges at the height of this very difficult period for the movement, the early 1980s. And you have, of course, domestically, um, neoliberalism is being invented with Reaganism and all the other things that are happening, which has this foreign policy element where people, are, people around the world are catching hell from American imperialism, right? Um, in, of course, in Great Britain, we have Margaret Thatcher on the, on the ascent and what that is doing to the world, right? And it's like, if you look at main, the, the master narrative, it's all about decline, right? The movement is declining in the 1980s or it's becoming something else. But for Robinson, it's continuing because he's looking to the world. He's looking to radical movements in the world and he's pointing to them and saying, pay attention to those people in Nicaragua. Pay attention to the people in uh, Yemen, Iran, Colombia, and the media, third world news, is actually giving reports of those movements every week. And, and he so, goes into does he go, he goes into Nicaragua? No, he he actually visits. Yes, right, um, right. in the late in the late eighties after um, Iran Contra is exposed. Um, so yeah, yeah, but um, it's 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 a it's a visiting, it's a engage, direct engagement, but it's also using radical media to talk about what's happening because if you look at the coverage of Iran or Lebanon or Ethiopia during the 1980s in the mainstream press, it's essentially the Washington line. There's no critique of it. There's no, um, there's no deviation from it. And so they break free from that because they actually have contacts 
he and his wife Elizabeth and many of the others that are involved in this have contacts on the ground. And they're, read, they're using those contacts and they're reading foreign language newspapers. And they're engaging with alternative media to bring to the people in the United States. But here's a revolutionary moment that we need to be paying attention to right now. Right? I think that's important because it shows that, you know, despite how things may feel in any given moment, there's always going to be some potential movement that we can connect to and we can build from that's going to help liberate all of us. You know, something else that I take from your work, although you don't use this category, and I'd like to see what you think about it, because it, for me, uh, it is, this, again, the social portraiture, the the temperament, uh, the humanism of Cedric Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, that he seemed to avoid sectarian traps. He, yeah. took, he took on ideas passionately, deeply, fiercely, but critiqued them only to the point that you, he could draw something out of them to take us to the next step of clarity, not as a way of diminishing or destroying them. And, so I yeah. think about him, your writing of him being uh, up at Bangington when Wallerstein is, is there and his look at world systems. He engages, you know, Kant and Hegel and Aristotle and all of these classical figures as well as uh, these mm -hmm. act, uh, Marx, Engels, uh, C.L.R. James, others, uh, right up into Wallerstein. But it seems like he was always taking the long view of history to the long view of the future. And that helped him seemingly avoid personality clashes. And again, I would like to know whether your work uh, sort of substantiates that, that reading. I, I, he couldn't avoid all the personality clashes. I think um, there are some people, uh, there were some people in his life um, who had different opinions, different ideas that there could, if there couldn't be any convergence. Um, I think about that in the context of his engagement with the, with the entire discipline of political science. Um, as an example, uh, his his PhD battle. Um, it just couldn't be, there was, there was, right? But in terms of revolutionary movements, in terms of the work of, of, of creating and building revolution, Cedric aligned uh, with people who were doing that from an ethical foundation more times uh, than not across areas of disagreement. Um, in fact, I think that's why in the book, the last few lines of the book, um, there is a moment of a deep uh, division. Um, and he, he says that, you know, every disagreement isn't precious. <laughs> every disagreement isn't precious. And so sometimes we have to uh, take disagreements as what they are, but if if they enable if they don't if they allow us to continue to do the work, let's focus on continuing to do the work. Um, I think there's an there's an academic side to that too. I think academics like to disagree. Um, academics like to have arguments. Academics like to have debates, and it wasn't as if Cedric was above those. But if we're going to have a debate, it's going to center how we make liberation struggles, how we make freedom how we make revolution. It's not going to center whether or not this particular translation of this text or this particular engagement with Aristotle reveals certain whether or not he was this or that, right? What does this have to do, as Ron Walters would say, what does this have to do with the liberation of Black people or our people? Um, Cedric will probably extend that, but, but yeah. Referencing Ron Walters, another um, Howard University stalwart, uh, I think easily definable as the most important applied political scientist of his time uh, with regard to bringing his deep knowledge about political mm -hmm. science, not just in the academy, mm -hmm. uh, but informing uh, national public policy as well as international public policy, uh, which is something about Cedric's own background. I mean, he, uh, he, he worked uh, in the area with, with youth um, in, in, in the Bay Area, um, Yes. around police issues. Um, and I think of so much of the debates of this time were some particularly among Black Marxists, Black Marxist Leninists, who in my view depreciate the issue of reform, that it, everything must be a revolutionary moment. Mm -hmm. Cedric clearly had revolution always uh, as the context of his work. Mm 
Mm -hmm. but that did not seem to inhibit or detract him from looking at very practical, immediate life-defining issues. He seemed to carry that balance well, which it seems to me that not only a lot of young activists, but some of us older activists are too quickly to bifurcate its either or and to personalize politics rather than to immerse ourselves in them. Well, I, I have to admit, I was shook when I found out that he worked um, in the probation office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right at right at right as he um, uh, graduates from Berkeley, he's done. He's he said he did all these people and did all these things in Africa and Mexico and with the Crawfords and Afro American Association for. And it's like, oh, what probation office? But then I had to realize that you know the state was something completely different. I think um, in terms of people who were using public resources during that particular era, um, trying to use uh, government uh, civil service um, as a means to improve the lives of people. Um, and especially in the in uh, in the East Bay, if you had a government job, it wasn't just you know not only a good job, it was also how do you figure out how to open doors for Black people to have equality in terms of state services? It's a big part um, of what you know other people were doing, especially in the Black Arts Movement much later, right? Um, but more than that, I think um, they were practicing even beyond what their job was. They were practicing other kinds of things within. That probation office. He and his wife Elizabeth. Um, she actually uh, was part of a radical criminology movement um, in in at, at uh, Berkeley, and they were actually um, I don't like to use the word first, but they were some of the first people who were thinking about uh, prison as a social and political form of containment, as opposed to a place where people who did bad things get punished. Um, she, she always cites Anthony Platt, um, who was a grad student at the time who wrote the book, The Child Savers, talking about the delinquency system in America. Um, and so that work was always, um, so that work was already there um, by the time the both of them go to work in the probation um, office in Alameda County. And then I also must add that when a few years later, less than a decade later, um, he has his first teaching job, permanent teaching job, at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, there is a class that they teach that's not in the curriculum. They had a program of radical community education where radical professors would devote a section of their syllabus to a radical topic, the radical professor. And so for Cedric, he devoted his class to the question of the prison. And the uh, radical uh, professor, um, his name is escaping me, but he was a member of the White Panthers. Um, uh, John Sinclair, okay. uh, who had been uh, given a 10 year sentence for marijuana. Um, and so I have the lecture notes to that class. And you see uh, Cedric really uh, thinking about what would become to known as prison abolition in 1972. In that particular uh, form, in that particular class, and so yes, you know, reform, abolition, um, is a really important uh, dichotomy uh, to think about. But I also think uh, that Cedric was also thinking uh, through the system as a means of understanding what it's what it's doing, but also what are the logics that underpin this system? Does reform get us to a point? In in, in his analysis in 1972 is that reform actually sustains the system. Reform is something that keeps it going. And so he begins to reject that idea. But the practical work that had the end product uh, and daily life of reform, it seems to me, was not reformism. It was right a step in this larger matrix that he had uh, of his deep commitment to revolutionary change, to systemic change. Right. And, and, and that seemed to keep him grounded. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and this may be my overly subjective read, although I think it's the read of a number of people when we say black Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost a skin color juxtaposition against uh, Marx was white, uh, Engels was white of, white of skin. Mm -hmm. um, but again, Cedric Robinson was not framed, it seems to me, at least as I read your portrait, uh, 
by the the outward complex. Uh, he was looking at the attitude, the worldview, including uh, black people with whom he differed because of their outlook and their practice. And it was not a so it was, and and I raise that because in what we have described perhaps unfairly as narrow nationalism, uh, but certainly contrasting it with revolutionary nationalism. Revolutionary nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that Cedric Robinson was grounded in a revolutionary nationalism, but also tied to a deeper humanism that did not have ethnic or racial uh, anchors at the end of the day. Is, is that an overconvolution or? Well, I think when you look at his narration of the Black radical tradition, right? It's a very specific way that peoples of African descent engage in their critique and living against the terms of capitalists and all the different manifestations of capitalism, which is, Western, which is really Western civilization, right? And I think in modeling that for us, we know or we see that it meant that these terms are our terms, but they are also an invitation to anybody else that wants to live like this. Right, which is why when you look at his his conversations about Korea or uh, Venezuela, you look at conversations about um, even parts of he talked about the free state of Jones in one of his books. Um, this is this is an openness and an invitation to be like us, to be with us, to be a part of us. But it's also like once you come into this space, it's a clear rejection of this other thing, right? Right. And that's when, that's when that's the that's the delineating factor, right? Um, and that looks different where wherever we are, but that's the thing that I sort sort of animates it. And so there's a point there's a point in Black Marxism, chapter seven, where he talks about this question of violence, and he talks about how sometimes violence was turned inward, meaning sometimes violence had to do with how we engaged in a kind of red line between ourselves. And that's a very complicated thing for, for it, was, it was complicated for me to accept at first. But what, but what it's saying is that don't look at it through the lens of violence, look at it through the lens of this is the term, this is the, this is the ultimate disciplinary and ethical separation between living one way and living another way. And so if you want to live this way, this is what you must accept, right? Don't bring in the idea of private property over here. <laughs> Don't bring in the idea of a racial hierarchy over here. Don't bring in these ideas that are responsible for our predicament, for our condition on the plantation. This is the maroon space. And in the maroon space, this is what we do. And I don't think about it as, uh, as disciplinary, even though I just used that word, or as a kind of rule-based, law-based sort of societal notion, I think about it in improvisatory terms. Like this is an improvisation on who we are. And so that means it's enough space for us to be adaptable, flexible, and human as individuals. And at the same time, you still have to be with us, right? You, can, you can't improvise on your own. Improvisation has to happen within the collective space. Right. And so. And, and, and there was always that underlying long-term ethical proposition of, right. of what might one again see as a socialist impulse right um well beyond the construct of 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 what marx or engels or lenin or even du bois becoming a communist might have seen as a socialist impulse because it seems to me that he sort of africa as the cradle of civilization and overworked uh, reference at times, it seems to me that he was suggesting that these unstudied communities, uh, mm -hmm. despite the distinctions, uh, not necessarily conflictual differences, but despite mm -hmm. the distinctions uh, among them, that they had lived, if you will, a mode of life right. uh, that you could find an underlying uplift of humanity in in very plural ways and that mm -hmm. uh, this was a crucible. I mean, he, the reference, and I'd like for you to take us a little deeper because I can't recall how deep your reference was about um, Palmares in Brazil, Mar uh, yeah. Sem uh, Semeranza uh, or, or Marinage, of, of when these enslaved Africans broke from the immediate structural uh, mm -hmm. organization and violence 
they went to their cosmological views, their ethical views, uh, their memory of not just memory, they were probably practicing many of these elements of social organization, even when they were hemmed in at night in the, in the dark, that this agency, if you will, uh, right. was the, was a, a crucible for, a, for the larger diverse humanity, not just for black people or African people. Right, right. And I think an, another example of that is the indigenous peoples of, the, of this whole hemisphere. Um, they practice some of the same kinds of ways of relating to other human beings and to nature and to the ancestors and to the creator that allow for us not to believe in the kind of racialized hierarchy that orders the modern world system, right? Um, and so you can't reproduce that hierarchy if your cosmology says that human life is a circle, it's not a straight line, right? So I mean, and that's not, that's not like I'm simplifying, but it's but it's really not. I think one of the powerful things that I um, that I learned about these particular uh, moments of resistance is that they're emanating from again pre-existing, as as Greg Carr says, pre-existing constellations of African thought, meaning there are patterns that are already there as they are being forced into this modern world system. And so the question becomes not just how I be free how I get free from the chains, how I get free from the labor regime, how I get free from the brutalization. It's also, how do I get back to a particular point where I can notice and recognize the constellation again, the pattern again, that it makes sense to us again, right? And that's why um, Marinage or Marunish was one of the first things that we did. Robin Kelly calls it the first principle of African resistance. And Robinson says that this is how we first responded. It was through it was through retreat. Let us get away so that we can get back to what we were doing before, right? Um, but then it has to change, right? Then it has to become something else. Why? Because the the modern world system tries to incorporate the entire world, and so there's no there's no mountains in it for us to go to now, right? There's no swamp for us to go to now, and so guess what? Robinson, I think, is gesturing to the fact that well, if there's nowhere else for us to go. The black radical tradition practices revolt, which means the whole system, the whole world has to now reflect a different kind of order, a different sense of how we relate to human beings, a different kind of system whereby we actually raise our children, build societies, develop a way of life. And that I think um, is the one of the lessons from Marunish. Right? What was different? How can it be applied now as we, understand it as an open invitation to anybody that wants to live differently. And, and very much uh, coinciding with the outlook of Amil Khal Cabral of uh, regrounding ourselves in our interrupted histories uh, yes. in, in, in order to uh, not just go back to some pristine past, that's not what he's saying, uh, but in order to have something concrete that we actually know at least in pieces to put that back together to depart from this chaos uh, that we're living in in now uh, and and it, it it strikes me that you know the, the debates emerging across the world uh, particularly uh, notable in Latin America uh, of um, departing from or having challenges around uh, vanguard parties versus social movements. Yes. Um, looking for new forms of, of liberation, uh, the, the citizenry, the discussions in, in, in Cuba about a participatory mm -hmm. democracy and some distinction to the overdetermined role of the state. Uh, it seems to me that Cedric Robinson was among others, was was foreshadowing and and dealing with with those kinds of uh, recalculations, if you will, about notions of, of 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 power. But one of you know, one of the things that concerned me, and it perhaps is my own limited reading, is what I think may be a potential of a romantic view of the power of the people. When I look at the bold outlines of the capitalist imperial state. Mm -hmm. uh, deep structures like the CIA, like military power, yeah. uh, like a deep state, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, mm -hmm. the accumulation so that uh, 
uh, when a president is elected, uh, we think that she or he somehow is the determining element, but they are actually being situated in sometimes centuries of accumulative context that they can take some individual latitude, but to overturn that, that context. And so this notion of the power of the people uh, is, is something I take away from him. But what in his writings, if anything, do you see that sharpens the point of the power of the people to take on the systems that of, of, of oppression? Faith. I think faith is there. I can't deny that. I think it's, I think, I think that could have been said, what you just said, I think it could have been said in 1831 too, right? I think it could have been said in 1791. Like something about our faith and capacity to be free when it seems like it's impossible is what I think we should take away from this reading of the black radical tradition. Um, there, are there, there, there are of course considerable changes, but I think when you talk about, I think it was, he, he cites James, C.R. James. And James talks about how, you know, the theorists are often behind the movements. The theorists are ahead of the movements, which means that part of the faith is being open to the fact to the fact that we might not see it coming as intellectuals, as scientists, as cultural workers, scholars, and even as organizers. As as political leaders, right. We may, right. We may not see it coming. We not we and we might not see how it can come, right? Um, so I think that's the best way uh, that I can answer. I, I do agree that the mountain seems very steep at this particular point. Um, it seems as if this behemoth is even as it even as there are structures that are obviously unstable. It seems that as a whole, right, that is insurmountable. But I also think that you know, the black radical tradition is about not believing that we can't win. <laughs> so I hold on to that belief and I hold on to a kind of um, an orientation that says, I don't have to be able to predict where it's coming from for it to be viable, for it to be a thing. But that the fact that it has happened time and time again over the millennia, right. we know that the people will find an invention to deal with the challenges before them. We just cannot uh, predict that and that we must be careful um, of these um, historicist views uh, of the working class. Uh, and when we look at the working class here in the United States of America, with the great majority of them voting for white supremacy, institutionalizing white supremacy, yeah. um, rejecting the other based on ethnicity or color or sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. um, we know that those frameworks minimally are stuck, but perhaps actually broken. And so that when something like Black Lives Matter Yes. emerges, there is a debate among a lot of leftists, a socialist, black Marxist, Leninist, including that rejects uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, either over personalizing it as this or that individual, or mm -hmm. saying that it's only about reform. But what we saw was not only a catalytic movement across the nation of literally millions of non people of color joining that concept of the society that you had talked about. We want to live like those people once lived in terms of the humanist expression. And then the uplift literally around the entire world. No question but that some of that was empathy and sympathy for the downtrodden Black people. But mm -hmm. another dimension of it seemed to me to be they are outlining the world in which I want to inhabit and be a proprietor of with them. Is that an over-reading uh, coming out of your book, particularly the last part of your book, where you get into the issues of humanism, of love that was exhibited through the life of Cedric Robinson? No, um, I think that has to be part of it. And um, when you talked about um, last summer, 2020, um, 
I, re I recall um, the new forward that Robin Kelly has written to Black Marxism where he begins with the summer of 2020 and he connects it to um, what Robinson is writing about. Um, and so I think it is, I think it is connected, um, in, intimately connected, right? Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that Monday in another event, I reference uh, W.E.B. Du Bois writing about this dream that he has, um, this dream that he had concerning uh, the end of colonialism in Africa. And it was a dream that he had at the turn of the century, at the turn of the 20th century. And he said, I believed in this, I believe in this dream. I Meaning it's not fantasy, it's not something that's implausible as sometimes dreams are, are given to be, which I, you know, when you look at another Robin's pieces of freedom dreams, um, there's even more to that concept of, of the dream. But Du Bois says, my dream became a fact. And so he's recalling his dream in 1961. He says, my dream became a fact. Dreams can become facts, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> and so right. It's, uh, it's on us to actually dream of the thing that we want because, they can become facts. And one of the things that I loved about how he sort of solidified his belief in the dream when he said he was young, he says, this I believe, one of my favorite quotes from this piece, and it's actually an unpublished piece, and um, I'm writing about it in my next book, but he says, this I know, to, to bring into the sort of notion of epistemology and knowledge, right? He says, this I know because I know Black people. Meaning, I know this is become a, this was going to become a fact because I knew black people. That's the kind of that's what I mean by the faith. I, and, and I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm feeling what you're saying, uh, and I'm thinking about my own training in the new communist movement and in dialectical and historical materialism as, mm -hmm. as an activist, not as a as a scholar intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, this work. Um, Cedric Robinson, the traditional Black Lives, has really moved me to begin to rethink, not to dismiss, but to rethink, mm -hmm. uh, particularly this bifurcation of um, uh, material reality and superstructure where ideas and culture and dreams and right. faith and religious expression and the blues and jazz mm -hmm. and uh, Charlie Minkus and poetry and politics Mm -hmm. uh, where we see those as the the cultural life of the black people, but we don't see that as the political life expressed in uh, the power of definition. Uh, mm -hmm. That if if you can name it, if you can dream it, mm -hmm. then there is the possibility to bring it into materiality to that to have yes. a real uh, uh, impact. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to. Uh, before we move to see if we can open this up in the tradition of Cedric Robinson, I'd like for you to talk a little about how about his wife and his relationship to students and how he saw himself in students and students in himself. And I would venture to say his wife having seen and both of them opening up their homes and building uh, that kind of collegial space, uh, well beyond the the immediate campus. It's a tradition that you know well. Sterling Brown is in a Sterling Brown tradition. Um, is it Mike Thelwood says a Sterling Brownian way? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what it is. And for those who don't know Sterling Brown, I mean, houses house was always open, and it wasn't just open, you know, because he was a social person. It was open because there was a belief that community produces knowledge. And I have a duty, right, to make sure that these students not, not only are cared and protected for and well-fed by Miss Daisy, but also that they know about the tradition and culture, right? And so it was a tradition that I knew well too because Greg Carr teaching, right, and being open, who was taught by John Henry Clark, teaching, open. We, we both, both Brown and Clark, um, talked about the importance of them, the importance of them as teachers. Um, and so I think uh, Robinson is in that tradition too. Um, he starts teaching um, in the late 1960s and he teaches past his retirement um, up until his, his passing away in 2016. 
Um, and so his door, his house, uh, his office, all of those were always open. Um, his uh, students almost always recalled his grace and, gener and generosity. Uh, sometimes with tears in their eyes because it was a, it was a something it was something about that generosity that opened them up to the to the criticality of the work. It was embodied in his generosity. The radical tradition was embodied by it. And so there's some people that say, you know, despite the fact that he was a generous person, I still have this critique of him. Well, I think you missed something about what where the generosity comes from, because it comes from the faith of the tradition and of the work, right? And so he can't be generous or his generosity can't have what it has without the black radical tradition. And that, and I think there's something to that. Um, and so he and his wife mentored many students who were activists. Um, they uh, were there to advise them. Um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, there were many fights um, around apartheid, around ethnic studies. They always supported the students. They were a thorn in the university side because of that. Um, but they knew that it's it's not that it's not only that the students were right, but we were responsible for their education too. So um, that translates into how uh, the graduate students that he um, advised would then practice that with their students. And so now we're like in the third and fourth generation of people who call themselves Cedric people because of that relationship um, that they had, and it's really beautiful to see. Um, they embraced me when they probably, I don't know, I, I don't know if I, if I would have embraced me if I was out, but they, but the reason that I think that they embraced me is because that's what they were taught to do. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I would say. There's a lot more to say, but that's kind of the basis of what I would say in terms, um, of their relationship. I, I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, sometimes people say my door is open, it's a metaphor, but they literally left their house door unlocked. And so students were always there <laughs> and it was really, it was, and also other younger faculty members too, um, you know, so yeah. So, so we, we've got a, a question from Laura Sullivan for you, which reads, in the course of your research and writing, was there any aspect of contemporary black radical organizing you were led to rethink or uh, that you might advise to be undertaken differently? Um. Not off the top of my head. Um, certainly not. I wouldn't advise. I wouldn't use this book as a book of advice per se. Um, maybe as a book that could uh, be used to generate uh, thinking, to generate engagement. Um, but I think it's on those organizations to themselves to uh, determine what route they take after that engagement and after that thinking. Um, so let me just go back and give some more context for why, for how the book was was conceived. So the book comes out of the Black Lives series. So my publisher is Policy Press. And their thinking was, how might we think about Black Lives Matter by engaging with a particular person, a particular individual? And so in that sense, what I wanted uh, Black Lives Matter, or I, what I, how I wanted to think with Black Lives Matter was, was ultimately what do we mean by Black life? I think that's where the book opens up. So I looked at Cedric's life as a Black life. I looked at the lives that he talked about as Black lives, right? And I think this last point of our conversation is that that's not an exclusive sort of closed door. Like black lives isn't black life isn't opening up, right? I mean, look at all the cultural traditions that, that we created. They're about opening the space, right? Right, right. And so, um, yeah, I think if Black Lives Matter, and it's hard to say because there are many different moving parts when you say Black Lives Matter. But I think one thing that um, maybe a takeaway, maybe not advice, but maybe a takeaway, is that you know there is always forces against the ability of black people to live. And there's also always a tradition that insists on black people's ability to live. Yeah, I, I would say to, to Ms. Sullivan's inquiry and, and, and hopefully complimenting what you've just said, because I, I tend to agree with as I'm understanding you, is that my reading of your portraiture of, of Cedric Robinson is that 
he opens up new fundamental angles for consideration. Again, it's not an outright rejection in many cases of the constructs and frameworks uh, that others have laid down, but he's saying that this is not wide enough. It's not deep enough. Um, the wall of that angle should be different than it is, or that there is a whole nother conception beyond this, that this is a step on the way, but it does not get us to the center of things, to the to yeah. the bottom of things. And therein was a, a tone of not personalizing and, and attacking the individual, mm -hmm. but really critically engaging the constructs that individuals put forth mm -hmm. and trying to extract from them what he thought was useful uh, without saying, and here is the final answer, without saying, but here's where I think the next step or set of steps might be right. uh, and it was always about engagement of real life what how are black people actually responding not to your theoretical proposition not that they are unimportant about illuminating things but what do we extract from their agency from their determination and particularly from the masses of people uh, hmm. of ordinary people again the profundity and the creativity of ordinary people mm -hmm. in some contrast to the more educated and the more reified, if you will, uh, whether we be academics or political theorists, uh, that there's something about uh, the real life of Black lives being the, the catalyst, uh, which gives us motion. We are not giving them motion. But it's, it's, so those are some things that I take away as for, as, uh, yeah. uh, I would say, instructive reflection. As I have heard, and I have not had a chance to speak to her recently, Angela Davis has been referencing, you know, here's a classically trained Marxist Leninist, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary intellectual mind and mm -hmm. the epitome of courage and, and, and heroic engagement and relationship to grassroots communities, whatever the class background be of giving, give, complimenting, engaging, integrating in that who uh, I understand has recently said, we really need to go back and reflect on what Cedric Robinson has put out and, mm -hmm. and think about where we are at this moment of time. And of course, Robin Kelly, I'd like for you to talk a little about what your relationship with Robin Kelly is. I know there's a new edition of Freedom Dreams, uh, oh. I guess at the, at the press at this moment or just out. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, it's, 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 it's coming out. I recently interviewed him and I can't recall how okay. soon it's coming out, but, but, there's, but there's a new edition of Freedom Dreams yeah. that he's working on. So my relationship uh, to Robin, uh, there was a brief, we briefly met, actually briefly met him uh, the one and only time that I actually met Cedric um, back in 2014 in uh, New York City. Um, but my relationship really grew um, after the Cedric's passing. And so uh, there were several uh, people that asked me to reflect on his work at the time of his passing. And um, as you know, Robin wrote his obituary. And so um, those pieces were circulating kind of like together in some ways, but um, he reached out to me uh, to thank me for writing uh, my piece. And um, at that particular point, um, I was actually working on the same book that I'm actually working on now, uh, which has a chapter on uh, Cedric. And since he had done some digging on the, bi on the biographical details of his life, um, I wanted to uh, share that piece, that chapter with him about uh, Cedric's, Cedric's bio. And so he ends up, um, you know, looking at uh, reading the whole piece um, as he does. He reads everything you send him. So. I shouldn't say that in public, but hey, because <laughs> <laughs> he's because he's he'll a read busy it. brother. Yeah, he'll read it. Yeah, but yeah. um, yeah. He'll, he'll definitely read read your read your work. But he did, and um, at that particular point, um, I sort of went back and started, you know, completing this particular book. But it's um, it's 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 it's, it's interesting. Um, I get an email from Polity saying, you know, we want to do a book on Cedric Robinson and. You know, Robin says you might be someone who might do it. I'm like, wait, me? Why me? And it turns out uh, there was something in that article that I that I sent him, that chapter that I sent him, um, that suggested I would be a person uh, that could that could write this particular uh, full-throated text. And so um, 
He was there at the beginning. He was there in the middle. He's there now um, as uh, someone, you know, if I could credit people, he would be, um, or give him official credit. I would give him official credit um, for being- Well, of course, it, and of course, Robin Kelly uh, uh, was a student of Cedric, Rob Cedric Robinson sat on his dissertation committee, as I recall. Yes. Uh, Robin Kelly, I would venture to say, is one of the most important scholars of our time. And personality-wise, uh, I, I feel a lot of a kinship in the way that you have described Cedric Robinson. He's on the landscape, but he's really in the landscape, not on it. He's not out there as a, a vertical profile scholar per se. He is really mm -hmm. finding his complementary and distinguished role with where black lives are unfolding, whether it's Jackson, Mississippi, looking at that as possible new cutting ground uh, that might be um, replicated in part in other ways, not just an interesting story to be told. And that seems to me to be very much in, in the Cedric Robinson tradition. We have a question um, from Shilleren. I'm sorry to mispronounce your name. I'd be interested in Professor Meyer's thoughts on the Blackburn takeover in relationship with Cedric Robinson's work. Wow. Um, so the, the initial the initial reaction is the relationship is that we should expect spontaneous moments and, and be able to use those uh, moments to force actual uh, changes. Um, it's a good question because in my first book, I actually try to link the impulse of those students who took over the A building in 1989 to Cedric's concept of the Black radical tradition. And one of the reasons that I was able to uh, make that link is because everything that those students told me that they were inspired by are the same ethical and cultural dimensions of Black radicalism that I've been thinking about for most of my academic and organizing career. And so I saw it reflected in how they pursued that particular occupation. I do not have any real relationship with the students um, other than a few who are, um, I've, I've spoken to a few, but there's, there is no real in, engagement with them. So I, I can't necessarily connect it in the same way, but I probably, um, if I did, I probably would. So it's, it's, it's certainly in the tradition um, of other Howard University protests from what I can tell uh, via social media because I haven't been able to go down there yet. Um, and so I, in that sense, um, Robinson for sure uh, would have supported um, the students, particularly uh, this demand that says that they should have a voice in what decisions are made, right? It seems basic, um, but it wasn't basic in the 1960s when they were organizing, right? Um, the students had to literally say that we are not children, we are adults, we should have a voice in what decisions are made about our education. And so the re in the reinscription of what is essentially in local parentis um, at Howard University is a cause for concern. Students should have the ability to make decisions about what happens to them, right? We're not parents. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Uh oh, I think you froze a little bit. I'll try to wait for you to come back. We are frozen. Okay. How are you back? <laughs> okay, we we we're back. Would you? We have another question, but would you quickly uh, relate that story? I think it's of the students decided that they were not going to write papers individually. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They were going to collect and they went to ask him. Yes, I'll be happy about, to. Yes. Yeah. So, um, um, HLT Kwan, who is a scholar out at Arizona State and very close friends, uh, former students of the Robinsons. And she told me this story about a final, a final exam uh, that Cedric had assigned. It was a take home final exam and it was to be done individually. And it was about uh, democratic theory, right? Uh, or notions of democracy, right? These robust notions of democracy that may not emanate from Western traditions and Western cultures, right? Um, is, again, what we've been talking about people, people as power. And his um, students were struggling with it. And so they, they came together and met and their idea was, why not you know, us, us write this collectively? And so 
H H H Q H O T Quan is known as H Q. Um, was given the assignment by the group to go to the rock, go to Cedric and ask for permission. And so it's late at night. And it's like, you know, should we call him Nate? So she calls him up. It's late at night. And uh, she asks, you know, we're doing this project. We're doing the take on final together. Is it OK if we submit it as a group? And Cedric says, if you have to ask, ask permission, you've missed the lesson already. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So student activism. And and I, I would say before we get to this next very important question, that your response about the importance of spontaneity is that it seems to me that my reading of, of you and your reading of Cedric Robinson is that he took and would take the long view that when these spontaneous things occur, mm -hmm. what is the role of the theorists? The, yeah. those who are looking at the long view of history and the accumulation of processes, how do we really interpret that beyond the immediacy of it? Is it connected? Do we see an evolving line uh, okay. rather than just another incident? And and so I, 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 I would take that away of saying that, you know, having been involved in the takeover of the administration building at Morehouse in 1969 with Mm -hmm. One of the principles of who emerged to be one of the principles of the Black Studies Movement, um, Dr. Gerald McWhorter, uh, um, 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 uh, Akalimat, uh, mm -hmm. Ab Ab Abdul Akalimat. You know, I think back to those moments and then these other spontaneous issues that I can see traces um, when you reflect on it, but you really have to reflect on it to see is history moving forward or backwards. We have another very important question from Brother Sanifu Onaje Umanachi. I hope I pronounced that last name properly. In your view, is the Black radical tradition exclusively a Black leftist project? Uh, there's a number of ways to interpret it, of, of interpreting that question. Um, so I, I hope I'm interp interpreting, it interpreting it correctly. Um, the Black left emerges uh, primarily as a product of the late 19th and 20th centuries, as I understand the Black left. Um, and so we're talking about a robust sort of designation that deals with how um, Black organizers and Black radical intellectuals are engaging with um, the constellation of forces that we call uh, capitalism, um, colonialism, imperialism. Now, that's connected to the Black radical tradition, but it's not synonymous with the Black radical tradition. The Black radical tradition, as I understand it, and as Cedric has written, Cedric Robinson has written, is really about the forms of resistance to slavery, colonialism that preceded the organizations that we call socialists, that preceded the movements that we call socialists. And he does the same thing in European, with European culture, that there are movements that precede what we know as uh, formal socialism or organized socialism. And so he's always talking about the importance of those kinds of movements and how they relate to these kind of theoretical and organized intellectual, intellectualized um, moments that happened in the 19th and 20th century, the kind of professional revolutionists in some ways um, emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so it's connected because many of those uh, people, he calls them the black radical intelligentsia with, with respect to the black left. Many of those peoples engage with the larger tradition of black radicalism that preceded their emergence and preceded their moment and preceded the forces that they were facing. They didn't face industrial capitalism, right? Um, not technically, right? And so um, I hope that answers it. Um, but as, as we were explaining before, um, it's not it's not exclusive in the sense that if you're not black, you don't get to be a part of this, right? It is exclusive in the sense that we have a ethic that says private property, that says racial racialized hierarchy, that says these forms of being that come out of the Western civilizational project don't have any purchase in this particular space or shouldn't have any purchase in this particular space. I, I, I'm going to take some license for a stretch of interpretation uh, to, uh, in response to that question and see what you, Professor Myers, think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, in um, I guess the theoretical extraction abstraction would be out of the particularity of Black life uh, in the modern world uh, in which capitalism, the, the relational uh, powers of capitalists and non-capitalists, uh, out of the particularity of Black struggle, 
emerges a universal need in which we are the test case, we are the crucible. I'm thinking about, again, Du Bois in 1903 in the Souls of Black Hope when he says that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. But then in 1953, on the Jubilee edition, when asked if he would consider rewriting the book, he said, no, in typical Du Bois in fashion, I want to leave it, quote unquote, as a monument to my thinking. He was a very vertical kind of, mm -hmm. of individual, although he was very embedded with the people behind the veil. He said something to the following effect. I still believe today as yesterday that the color line is a major question of the 20th century, not the. But I've come to understand that behind it, there's something that both impels it and obscures it at the same time. And this is where he gets at the class issue, I think. Yeah. That a few people are willing to live with power and luxury at the great expense of humanity living in poverty and disease. Mm -hmm. And that in order to preserve this social relationship, they are willing to go to power inevitably or uh, invariably against people of color. Right. You go back then 50 years earlier in the Souls of Black Folk, and he talks about in that preface, all of the people of the Mediterranean Sea. So this was not a simple black-white dynamic. He was looking at a global system and the pivotal role of racialized capitalism, where it seems to me Cedric Robinson really opens up new avenues of interpretation and most importantly of organization. Yes. And that when we look at the contemporary world, if we just look at the Americas, for example, the great majority of of African descendants live in Brazil, over 100 million, um, mm -hmm. Colombia and other places. R the racialized nature of the capitalist system leads to the most egregious inhuman indices and violence and disease and incarceration. And therein, other liberatory movements of other groups really need to integrate themselves with that pivot. It's not that we have the answer for each and every group. Yes but that the question of democracy and the uplift of humanity is not going anywhere without censoring us. Now, a thousand years from now, it may be the Latino question of 500 years or a hundred years. And mm -hmm. but right now, in terms of the world system, the order, we are still central to that. And if you read Islam as non-European, it's, it's racialized in many ways. Or, and, and so, yes, I think the, mm -hmm. It, it, it is a black leftist humanitarian project. We have another question. Thoughts yeah. on the need for a martyr in order for black voices to be heard. How do you think that unfortunate pattern could correlate with Robertson's theories? I'm not sure I understand that, but tell me if you get the question. Well, I can, I can attempt to take a stab at it because um, it, it all depends on what they mean by mar martyr, right? And so do, do you mean someone um, Taking the position or taking the taking the idea of resistance as something that means my physical life might have to be extinguished in order for this particular movement movement to continue, um, or if it's modern in this, uh, or or if it's modern in another sense, right? I think when uh, when you see black people sacrifice their lives for the struggle, it's not necessarily as a tactic to be heard. It's as a kind of instantiation of the kind of spiritual and political meaning of, of, of Black radicalism, right? Meaning, if we are forced to live life under these particular conditions, then resistance that might or might not result in my death is more logical than accepting these conditions. Um, do we call that being a martyr? I don't necessarily uh, call that being martyr martyrhood, um, but if that's what the um, questioner is, is trying to get at, then I think uh, Robinson has a very real appreciation for uh, the sacrifice, the uh, the ability to uh, take risks um, that are embedded in all of our forms of resistance. Good response. Um, tell us, while we wait to see if there are other questions or comments, and we invite not just your questions, but your critiques of what you have heard or what you think, as well as your formulations, that is very much in the Cedric Robinson and his wife's tradition of building community, learning community. That quote where he says, um, I hope you don't, to students, I think it's something like, I hope you don't see um, uh, me and you uh, but see, but because I see myself in you, 
And yes. therefore, that is why you see me. I think that was the linkage. That was the sort of the dialectic. Did I did I get that? Well, he said that it's hard for me to see. It's hard for me to see how much I've influenced uh, you because I am you. Right. Which means that you are influencing me, that yeah. uh, young voices, uh, students, he saw them as colleagues. That was something that that I talked to my students about. It was very difficult for them to look at it is that. This is a reciprocal learning process here. Of course, my experience and, and whatnot, be, just simple chronology has mm -hmm. uh, put me in situations that younger people may not have been in, but it does not necessarily compute uh, that I bring more to the table than they bring. And we we will only know that by what we get from, from one another. And it seems to be very much a, a part of the ethical and humanistic construct mm -hmm. that Robinson and, and, and his wife yeah. Uh, lived wherever they were teaching, wherever he was doing uh, um, uh, research. Um, I just want to affirm your last response when um, you talked about the kind of particularity to the universal. Um, the last page of Black Marxism, um, Cedric writes, um, it is not the province of one people to be the solution or the problem, but a civilization maddened by its own perverse assumptions and contradictions is loose in the world a black radical tradition formed in opposition to that civilization and conscious of itself is one part of the solution. And we are definitely one part of the solution of the contemporary world of, of wither uh, humanity at this crisis moment, both of a COVID epidemic, uh, climate uh, uh, epidemic and fascism sprouting uh, everywhere and uh, basic reform movements having to give way to social democratic policies or democratic socialist policies. But it is only through the testing of these social democratic policies and democratic socialists that we will find whether they will be the leveler or whether we will go deeper. And where I would say Cedric Robinson was projecting where Karl Marx, C.L.R. James, Emil Karl Cabral, uh, Septim McClark, uh, all of those people saw the systemic problem uh, even as they transgressed on a day-to-day -day basis. Let us close by you telling us about what your upcoming work is, uh, and then we will hear again from Sister Makala Skirlock, uh, who will close us out um, around uh, the Sankofa video and book uh, shop of people of African descent. Yeah. Um, so the next book um, that I'm almost completed um, is actually a book that takes uh, Cedric as one of three others, of one of four scholars um, in the Black Studies tradition who are transgressing the idea of disciplinarity, the notion that we can talk about our lives um, through the lens of the academic categories that were given to us. And so the reason that I'm doing that particular book is because there is a conversation, um, a long conversation in Black Studies about what disciplines make up Black studies or what is the relationship between Black studies and, and existing disciplines. When I'm looking at Cedric Robinson and, and W.E.B. Du Bois and Sylvia Winter and Jacob Carruthers as scholars who actually explode that conversation in very important ways and looks again at how um, to really study Black people, these disciplines might not actually help us get to the root of the things that are most important. Um, and so it's a really, uh, Black studies oriented, Africana studies oriented text, um, but I do think it's going to have value beyond just people who are practitioners of Black studies. I can hear Ancestor Vincent Harding cheering you on thinking about those Institute of the Black World, Atlanta, Georgia, yes. uh, catalytic developments around Black studies. And yes. of course, uh, Dr. Harding's uh, a huge uh, inspiration. Vincent Harding's a huge inspiration. Right. Uh, 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 Abdullah Kalimat has just published in the last few days or last week a new volume looking at the history of Black Studies, a very important figure, a uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, radical applied professor who has impacted generations of, of students. Uh, it would be really interesting to hear his thoughts about Cedric Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh Mize, I really want to thank you. I, I, I hope um, that the context that I brought to this has helped to illuminate uh, yes. the importance of, of uh, your portraiture, your social portraiture of Cedric Robinson, the examination of his theories.
Uh, there are a lot of nodal um, elements of his concepts and theories that I decided we would not bring into view here. Uh, they are weighty, and I urge all of you to go to Sankofa or go online. Um, uh, Michaela Skerlock is going to come back on now, I think, and give us some instructions of how you can get to this book and uh, how you can be in communication uh, with Professor Josh Myers. And when you get an opportunity, go drink some coffee, read some books, look at some videos, uh, and look at the biographies of, of both uh, Haile and Sharikiana, who have made extraordinary contributions and continue to do to the development of black critical thinking uh, to black lives. And in that regard, in the Cedric Robinson tradition, uh, to uh, extraordinary contributions to uh, humanistic uplift for us all and liberation for us all. Thank you, James. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. How am I supposed to talk after that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Myers and Mr. Early, for doing this and having this expansive um, conversation. It was really enlightening. I know everyone else enjoyed it, um, judging on the comments. And I just want to let everyone know um, that this conversation will be archived. So when you go and get the book, you can come back and listen and you can read along. And that way you can have more of an idea of um, what was being said and you have more foundational information. But with that being said, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you to the audience for watching. And we hope to see you again on the next one. And you can purchase um, Cedric Robinson, The Time of the Black Radical Tradition at www.sankofa.com. And we'll have some in the store very, very soon. Thank you again. Have a great night, everyone.